the old west, dangerous, open, wild and free, where you could find your fame and fortune or meet an end at the hands of bandits. A period of freedom, of suffering. It was truly a pivotal moment in history. <clears throat> all, right, all right, enough of that. Cowboys, the railroads, brutalities committed on native people. W Will Smith was there. It was a watershed moment in the US whose echoes are still felt to this day, both structurally in American capitalism and also in our common culture. The classic romance of cowboys, the struggle to tame the wild west, and the harsh realities people faced in this unknown wilderness. The fantasizations of this era grew from stories of heroic or villainous cowboys to movies fully living in the cowboy dream. Americans took to these movies for obvious reasons as it was a major part of our historical culture, but so did the rest of the world as well. John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Gary, Gary Cooper, Cooper, all these actors whose names are synonymous with the era for their roles of stoic, cold cowboy portrayals lived in worldwide fame all stemming from this love of the Wild West, a so-called true statement of freedom. People identified with the gritty heroes in precarious situations, staying cool and collected, saving the day and riding off into the sunset off to be a cool ass hero somewhere else. These heroes resonated across cultures, and across those cultures related back to their similar histories. The Japanese samurai, in the same vein as the cowboy, is a wandering hero roaming from place to place in search of their own goals, be it strength, fame, fortune, or peace. They arrive and do their diligent honors, then move on into the sunset of this untamed Japan, off to be a cool ass samurai elsewhere. These similarities in historical heroes spark the interest in Japan and our western heroes, the same rough and rugged tales as their samurai. Except it's 2021 at the time of this recording, and we know a lot more now than we ever did before. The romancing of both samurai and cowboys in the recent years has been faced with the reality of, yeah, most of these people were total assholes, robbing the poor and killing innocents to survive, moving past the initial romance period and firmly into actual history itself. We now know it wasn't just a time of cool heroes doing the right things, it was a time in both cultures of strife and pain, of brutal expansion, and of human greed. These were really dark days for the world. And that's one of the reasons that makes Trigun, a story about a pacifist who's trapped in the cycle of this dark western world, so impactful. Trigun is the manga by Yasuhiro Naidao, a former media studies major who, like a lot of mangaka before their big breaks, just drew doujins as a side hobby while in college. After graduation, he moved on into real estate while still drawing as a side hobby, before finally being convinced by his friends that he should really try and make a go at becoming an artist. He noted that his early influences and favorite mangas at the time were things like Captain Harlock, Space Battleship Yamato, Galaxy Express 999, all manga by the legendary author Leiji Matsumoto, he's uh, this one here, who created stories that focused on striking character designs, feeling of movement and flow with the wind, both literally and figuratively, and very, very prevalent themes of humanity, discovery, and freedom. He created the modern space exploration genre and influenced an immense amount of anime and manga. Things like Cowboy Bebop, Outlaw Star, Gurren Lagann, Excel Saga, Gunbuster, and Anno in general, they all hail from his influence. His stories bleed passion and heart, and all star characters who were like the definition of 70s space cool. Reason you just saw him with Daft Punk is because he also made Interstellar 5555, the anime movie that goes along with Daft Punk's Discovery album. I highly recommend all three of the series I just mentioned, and uh, Daft Punk too I guess. They are monumental to the modern landscape of manga and anime, and Matsumoto was a legend in the medium. The first thing Night Owl released that was officially published was a one-shot based on Samurai Showdown, with this big ol' Halmaru on the front. For his first official one-shot, the art was striking and bold, immediately catching the eyes of publishers. Being spurred on once again by his friends, he submitted his one-shot, The Early Concept of Trigun, to the magazine Shonen Captain in 1995, which at the time was famous for series like Giver, Legends of the Galactic Heroes, and uh, apparently these really cool looking X-Files one-shots that I, I can't find any info on? S someone please s send me this info, I need X-File manga in my veins, that sounds like it was made just for me. Anyway, that one shot with its stylish main character who was just as goofy and easygoing as he was cool and intimidating, mixed with incredibly flashy art, it would go on to change the landscape of manga going forward, just as the things it was inspired by did before it. 
Trigun began in 1995 in Shonen Captain like I had mentioned earlier, but ended only a year after its initial publication as the magazine itself was going defunct. These 20 chapters would be compiled together into what is now known as Trigun. A few years later in 1997, Night Eye was approached by the magazine Young King Hours to see if he would be interested in publishing a new work for them. He expressed sadness over his initial run of Trigun being cut so short, as the plot was really just beginning to develop, new characters were just introduced, and he wanted to continue the story in the world he had created. The magazine agreed, allowing him to pick back up directly where the story had left off. He shifted the genre from shonen to seinen, claiming this run would be much darker than the initial chapters, and added the subtitle Maximum, effectively making Trigun Maximum, his story now continuing in full force. Alright, so first up, here are the warnings. Most people when they think of Trigun think of the 1998 anime by Madhouse, and for good reason, it's a perfect anime. That being said, I really think the manga is something incredibly special as well, and a lot of people really don't know too much about it. So I want to really dig in on the manga for this video as it is where the series itself begins before circling back around to talk about the anime as well. At first I'm going to focus on the world, characters, combat, early anime episodes, you know, the basics and stuff that I wouldn't consider spoilers at all. Once time comes, I'll give you some warnings before we talk about the core themes of the manga and anime, and a deeper look at the characters and how they differ and connect with each other. Cool? Trigun follows the story of wandering gunslinger Vash the Stampede, an infamous chaotic force of nature known around the world as the Humanoid Typhoon, a title he's earned by causing absolute destruction and devastation wherever he may roam. Vash wanders around the planet Gunsmoke, or named Gunsmoke in the anime at least, that's, so that's why I'm gonna call it for this video, a desert wasteland of a planet that is, for the most part, absolutely inhospitable for normal human life. Between the brutal heat, arid land and the monsters that roam beneath the deep sands, humanity gathers around crashed spaceships from their forefathers, building outwards from them and expanding into small towns across the wasteland. Inside these crashed ships are the lifeblood that exists to keep humanity alive on this world. Structures known as plants, which seem to be giant light bulbs that give off an almost otherworldly source of power and energy that can be used in countless different ways. From lighting a town's electricity to furthering the production of nature and water sources, humans cling to these plants to survive, desperate to make sure that no matter what, the juice always flows from them. Life on the planet Gunsmoke is brutal and unfair, with gangs of bandits that roam the deserts looking for easy prey to hunt and capture, whether it's for robbery or fun. Among these desolate towns full of broken people and violent gangs that terrorize those same towns, walks Vash on an eternal quest to find a certain man. Along his journey, he meets a multitude of people, both good and bad, who influence the path that he walks and the decisions that he must make. Decisions that can mean both life and death for whoever is involved. Upon reading these first few chapters, or watching the first few episodes of the anime, you get an immediate taste of the multiple things this story is putting down. 1. Gun combat is king, and you can expect to see all kinds of interesting firearms throughout the series. Left foot two stomps. The art style has massive focus on flair and style, sometimes to its own detriment, with characters constantly showing off flowing cloaks, action poses that defy anatomy, extensively detailed full page spreads, and a lot more examples that I'll talk about here shortly. And three, Vash as a character has a lot more going on inside than his reputation or skills would ever have you believe. Combat in Trigun is not what you would consider classic combat for a lot of series. While most fights in series involve things that range from signature moves and detailed explanations of powerful attacks, to outright fights that don't really require any explanation or detailed events of what's happening, altercations in Trigun fall somewhere right in the middle. Battles are handled with a barrage of bullets, focusing more on quick gunplay, new and intricate firearms that just defy basic logic, and strange, sometimes otherworldly methods of fighting at distances, usually forcing the opposite character to use a gun to close the distance between themselves. Between each villain and side character you meet, one initial thought is almost always there outright in the forefront of, alright, what, what dumbass gun are they about to whip out? Because the absurdity and variety in the series' firearms is always new and fun. Vash is known across the world for using his signature gun, an AGL Arms 45 caliber Long Colt revolver. Wolfwood keeps his preacher's cross by his side, which uh, has a cool name I won't spoil, a double gun that fires machine gun rounds and rockets cause uh, it's full of mercy. 
there's a briefcase that shoots giant crimson red nails, an actual gun sword, get fuck squall, a supersonic saxophone with a machine gun mouthpiece, the list keeps going and always stays ridiculously exciting. This gun-focused combat helps add a sense of intensity in the flow of events, with multiple pages being devoted to showing off the immense amounts of firepower that can sometimes be used, leveling entire buildings with nothing but bullets, the constant use of repeated onomatopoeia effects really hammering home just how loud and destructive they are. In that same sense, it helps add a more realistic air to the combat. A lot of times in manga and anime that fall into the same category as Trigun, guns and bullets kind of come off as the lesser weapons, usually being too weak to damage anyone in major battles, and the focus kind of shifts back towards melee weapons, hand-to-hand -hand fights, or shonen powers. But in Trigun, a bullet is a bullet. A gunshot wound is as devastating here as it would be in real life. Again, this adds a sense of realism and believability to the series because when someone is shot, instead of wondering, oh, how, how are they going to get out of this one, who's going to swoop in and save them and this just be a lame flesh wound, you instead think, oh, oh god, oh shit, oh fuck, no, 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 not like this, come on, right here, like this, come on. It's legitimately nerve-wracking because you know in a series like this, that bullet was enough to kill someone. And like, I just absolutely adore this style of combat. It makes battles so much more intense because you know that these bullets are real to the characters. They will kill, and you just have to hope that your favorite character doesn't end up catching one this time. As the series progresses and the combat becomes much more wild and bombastic, even when everyone else may be doing some weird anime bullshit, Vash will raise up his gun, a true gunslinger for love and peace. This combat, of course, is all pushed even further by the pure style of the series. Trigun's art is something that seems to be a bit divisive online. Night Owl's philosophy of drawing seems to stem back from one original idea, an idea that never goes away throughout any of his works, past or future. The same idea that made me love Shaman King as much as I did, which uh, I talked about in this other video over here, you should, you should probably watch it, it's real good. <clears throat> the idea of, I just want to draw cool shit. First and foremost, in all of his series, Trigun especially, Night Owl has one clear focus in mind and it's making whatever's happening on screen look as stylish as possible. Now this works, most of the time. Personally, I love the way he draws shots. Character anatomy gets loose and he isn't afraid to get wild and dense with a panel, sometimes even going a bit too hard where you'll kinda need a whole five minutes to register what you're actually sitting here looking at. And during combat scenes, sometimes the stylish implications of what's happening are all you really have to go on. No extra explanations of what actually just happened given to you. Now I can deal with and personally like this, but as the series goes on, especially in the jump from Trigun to Maximum, his art style definitely grows and develops, becoming much, much more clear and fluid over time. But I know a lot of people just don't necessarily like how busy it can be, which, which is fair, I mean hell, I'm not here to tell you what art you can and can't dislike. But to anyone who was turned off by those initial early pages, I think it might be worth a relook to see how you feel about Maximum. During that year and a half-ish period between magazine publications, Night Owl's art definitely progressed, with panels becoming much more defined and easy to follow. Towards the end of the manga, he does go much harder with the style and the implications of events rather than just explaining all the details outright, but if you've already read it that far, I have a feeling it'll hit you perfectly. It's a mixture of stark, depressing dialogue and immensely beautiful art that combines together to make something truly special to read. And if you still don't like it, hey, at least you tried. Go watch the anime. It's also fantastic and I'll talk about it here in just a bit. Now, this isn't to say Night Owl doesn't know how to use empty space just as well as his busy shots. Plenty of times in the series, he also likes to pull his busy style back some, instead letting the characters breathe on vast, open panels, focusing more on their inner emotion and turmoil than his usual stylish cool gunfights. These shots go such a long way in showing the absolute despair someone can feel in the heat of the moment stripping away other objects in the frame to solely focus on that single person and what they're struggling with, be it internal or external. From intense choreographed gunplay to just someone reacting to the events in front of them, the structure of the art conveys it all with both style and impact, with those same feelings translating directly into the characters themselves and how they are expressed through the art. 
And this is one of the core things I want to really try and get across, just how incredibly heartfelt and touching simple shots of the characters' emotions can be throughout the manga. For someone like Night Owl, whose major focus is in cool shit with gum battles, visually seeing constant reminders throughout the series about how these characters think and feel just written in their expressions, it really helps hammer down their believability and how much you can connect with them. When Vash smiles his empty smile, or a smile that's holding inside years of loneliness and pain, you feel it as well because you can see it. It's like you're looking at someone you personally know who's trying to hold it in, trying to smile so the rest of the world moves on without notice, and it just stings. This hollow smile propped up by wishful thinking and constant sorrow, letting us know that there's just so much more that's under the surface for Vash. But before we talk about Vash's struggles and a lot of that spoilery stuff, let's talk about what a lot of you were probably here for. In April of 1998, the first episode of Trigun aired on Japanese TV. Produced by Madhouse, known for things like Redline and Hunter x Hunter, as one of the earliest solo animes that they had ever done. Its first episode is actually an anime-only story that absolutely encapsulates the allure and mystery of both the world of Trigun and Vash himself. Involving a three-way mix-up, the anime kicks off with a story of bandits, bounty hunters, and insurance agents, all looking for Vash for both business and profit. Upon the three groups meeting, they realize that they all have completely different details of what Vash the Stampede looks like, no one really knowing who here for sure could be the real Vash. Through quick movement and diversion, the real Vash is able to quietly slip away, letting the would-be hunters all argue amongst themselves before going back once again to rescue hostages that the hunters had taken to lure him out. Within this first episode, you are both told and shown a few important things. Vash is a legend across the world for both the bounty on his head and the destruction he causes. He is also a giant goofball who goes out of his way to avoid using his real name if possible to keep his identity hidden. Also, he refuses to let any innocent suffer, shown by him returning to save the hostages that have been taken specifically to capture him, but while going out of his way to not fatally harm any of the bounty hunters. These few important details are the main characteristics that make up Vash, and are the ones that he continues to follow and grow upon throughout the series. They're all presented in a fun way to you right up in this front first episode, letting you know immediately what kind of guy Vash is, while still leaving plenty below the surface to reveal itself later down the line. Mixed in with these introductions in the first episode, you're also greeted with what is one of, without a doubt, the best anime OSTs ever put to a show. Trigun's soundtrack is incredibly a perfect mix of western trappings, heavy 90s rock, and very rhythmic jazzy flows. Each song has multiple versions of itself to both add in and remove instruments to help change the emotion of scenes, the music diegetically changing during the course of the scene to add in more drums, guitar, bongos, whatever so the scene peaks, and when it does, the music slaps you in the goddamn face like it's fucking rules of nature, it's, it's just so perfect. I've used some of it for the background in this video, but I recommend listening to it on your own time when you can at a natural volume. Also, can't, can't show most of that here. Got copyright, I'm gonna kill my ass. No, fuck you. No, not happening. After this first episode, the anime begins in full swing, adding in both new anime-only stories and direct chapters from the manga, mixing them around and kind of doing its own thing with it. At the time of its initial airing, the Trigun manga had run its course, and Maximum was only back for around a year at this point, so they realistically only had the 20 chapters of Trigun, and then about another 20 to 30 chapters of Maximum to work with. That being said, Maximum would go on to run for 97 total chapters, so the amount of story they had to work with was fairly short, deciding to take major elements for the plot and working it into a thematically similar, albeit very different story. So to break it down exactly, these are the 26 episodes of the anime, and these are the chapters they're adapted from. As the anime progressed, it would continue to take chapters from the manga, but alter the stories in them to create a new path to follow towards its own end while the manga continued to run. Using that, you're left with these episodes that really take the series and go in its own direction, but thankfully never stray too far off from how these characters truly feel and act as the manga progresses. 
Also, I can't find any hard info on this, but as Maximum continued, there were multiple elements from the anime that appeared in later chapters, both characters and smaller plot details. Not sure if Night Owl provided these details for the anime, or if he just enjoyed the anime enough to incorporate them into the manga itself. This all adds together for fans who, like myself, loved the anime but hadn't read the manga yet. You'll like how the plots differ and later elements and details from the anime are mentioned in the manga. It's a cool mix of an experience that makes both ways of enjoying the series really great and different but in connecting ways, seeing the similarities and differences between the characters themselves. And with that, I want to talk about those characters, specifically Vash, Wolfwood, and the center of conflict in this hellish desert planet, Millions Knives. Alright, yeah, spoiler warning time. I'm going to be talking about the core of Vash's pacifism and how it's related with other major characters in the story, both anime and manga. I'll be talking about these three characters and how their relationships are the core themes, so be warned now anime only people. While talking about these three characters, I'm going to be using info from the anime and extensive info from the manga that differs heavily from the anime, so please keep that in mind. So here's a time code for anyone who just wants to skip past any of the spoilery stuff. It'll be covering stuff from around volumes 1 of Trigun to about volume 7 of Maximum and specifically episode 17 of the anime. Cool? Doing the right things in a world of wrong is tough. It almost feels useless at times, like you're doing good in a world that exists to be bad trying to lend a helping hand while others snatch from the same hands, an endless cycle of selfishness and misery. Humanity is a callous thing, something that's easy to become disillusioned with, losing faith in a positive future. That's why it resonates so well when you see someone who's been beaten by the cycle of humanity, a person who through time has seen the constant darkness of man itself, still smiling and fighting for a better future whatever that future may be. The feeling goes even deeper when that person isn't even a human and is confronted with these moral struggles themselves and instead of hating or even disliking humanity, they accept and embrace it. I mentioned earlier that humans on this planet cling to plants, the light bulb power generators that keep humanity alive. In humans' quest for exploration and renewable power, these plants were created to push humanity forward the plant inside the bulb itself being a fully artificial being created by human hands serving as generators for ships to explore space, finding humans a new home among the stars. During this voyage on a specific ship, a plant version marries out two artificial plants itself in the form of human looking babies, brothers known to Rim, the crew member who found them, as Vash and Knives. Shortly after their birth, within the following year, They've grown to be full-size kids, around the ages of 12 or so if I had to guess, living on the cradle of humanity in space with Rim. Both of the brothers have abilities that allow them to sort of integrate with plant technology, letting them control what the plant's power is currently fueling, like for example the ship itself they live on, since they themselves are plants. Now in the anime? These three live alongside a few other crew members as a small team, while in the manga it's just these three, the rest of the crew and humanity itself in a cold sleep on the ship. This change drastically affects the events to come in the stories, whereas in the anime, Vash and Knives are victims to both verbal and physical abuse at the hands of one of the crew members for being something that isn't quite human causing Knives to become disillusioned with the idea of humanity in general, feeling them to be the weaker, therefore inferior beings. Seeing them so much lower than himself, he falls into a sea of hatred, dedicating his entire existence to wiping humans away from the galaxy, causing the downfall of the entire fleet of ships from the Earth, carrying a sleeping humanity to their future. Now, in the manga, his ideals are the same, with his hatred of humanity being his driving force in life, but it stems from a very different place. As Vash and Knives grew up together with Rim on the ship, they lived a quiet, happy life, almost like a mother and her sons, growing to understand and love each other despite the brothers being artificial beings. 
This relationship, though, is shattered one day while, during an exploration of the ship, Vash and Knives come across something that would alter their lives and ideals forever. Tucked away, hidden from them and anyone else locked in a medical room, are records. Records of the first time a plant gave birth to anything similar like Vash or Knives, a small girl named Tesla. Records that show human curiosity and selfishness took priority, with no regard to the well-being of this strange artificial child, and Tesla being used for immediate experiments. Records that showed the brutal, torturous life she suffered. Records that showed humanity's callousness in their methods, caring only about progress. Records that show a small 229 total days of her living before her body could no longer regenerate from the countless damage, developing a rapid cancer that ate her away before being discarded as a failed medical experiment. And finally, the records that prove Rim and the sleeping crew willingly took part in these same experiments. Both brothers, upon learning how humans treated their plant brethren, caring only for their tests and data, split inside themselves before Knives blacks out from the traumatic events he's just learned. Vash locking himself and his brother away from Rim, refusing to eat or sleep until he also passes out in a painful fear. Upon waking up, Vash is met with a tearful Rim, now terrified by who she truly is. A human, something that intrinsically is very different from him. Between the info he's learned mixed with being forced to come to terms that he and his brother are different from everyone else, he begins to break down, realizing that there's no true place for him and his brother to exist, no place that will ever be theirs. This galaxy just wasn't made for them. Falling deeper into despair, Vash attempts to take his own life before being stopped by Rim telling him not to treat his life as some little thing. To Rim, life itself is a gift, with each person having a blank ticket to do whatever they want in life, and to take your own or another's lives would be the worst thing that you could do. As they continue to talk and recover together, Vash comes to accept Rim for who she is and what she's done, understanding that her past is the past, and they must look towards the future together. And at that moment, Knives finally awakes, still sleeping from falling unconscious caused by the trauma he was shown earlier, oblivious to why he's been asleep for so long and why both Rim and Vash look so concerned. They decide together that it's only right that Knives knows the truth as well, explaining the events that had taken place both leading up to him and after passing out. But there's a major difference now between Knives and Vash, that being Vash woke up first. Rim and Vash had both struggled and come to terms with each other, with Vash going to be willing to accept humanity and forgiving Rim of her past, all while Knives still slept. Now Knives, both awake and learning of these events once more, is alone. His brother, the only person like him in the entire world and the entire galaxy, had already accepted these facts and was completely prepared to move on, prepared to let the past just be the past and create a new future together. And while Knives did at first try to suppress these feelings of fear and anger inside brought on by the truth, just like Vash had first felt, he just couldn't. He refused to accept humans for what they were, angry and unable to understand his brother's thoughts on them and why he was so forgiving of them because he honestly at his core just couldn't. He can't let the sins of the past be forgotten and swept away like they had been before. He couldn't let these humans do again what they had done before to his kind, experimenting and stealing for their own uses. And lastly, he couldn't forgive his brother for betraying his own kind, siding with the ones who caused their suffering. Using his ability to manipulate plant technology, Knives is able to cause the downfall of the fleet of human ships onto the uninhabited wasteland of a planet below. Now linking back up to the story of the anime, the brothers left wandering this new world together as the fleet rains down above them, humanity's last lights being snuffed out. From this point forward, their relationship is shattered. 
Nav, sick of Vash's idealism and obsessions with humans, and Vash, unable to forgive Nav's for causing the countless deaths of humans as he brought the ships down, Rim included. Nav's leaves his brother alone in the wasteland, setting off on his own journey, a quest to finish the job he had started high up above on their ship. Not satisfied with just his genocide, his anger towards Vash had grown far past the point of peaceful living together with moral disagreements, with his second goal to cause his brother immeasurable suffering for his continued love and pity for humanity. And from this point forward, opposite to his brother, Vash follows a strict code of pacifism at any cost. His refusal to kill anyone is planted deep down in his roots, and he will not shake his morals for anything. This leads Vash down a painful life of over 150 years of living, causing constant damage to himself from his absolute unwillingness to ever kill someone, leaving the scars and wounds of the past covering his body. He trains constantly through over-the-top accuracy challenges to learn precise shooting to incapacitate or disarm, but never to kill. If he kills, the promises he made to Rim die along with her memory, and he could never forgive himself. This begins Vash's path of pain and strife, his refusal to kill never wavering, facing the suffering of humanity head on to fight for the peaceful future. This path he walks leads to many different people who really kind of serve as the challenges to the theme of the story. The people of the planet live in constant struggle, many resorting to violence and desperate measures to survive. To them, they don't get to choose between what's right and wrong, they can only choose survival and among them walks Vash, extending a helping and peaceful hand whenever possible towards anyone he meets, making both friends and enemies along the way. Among those friends is one Nicholas D. Wolfwood, a traveling priest on a planet that's forsaken God. Wolfwood comes across initially as a guy who's not too much different from Vash himself. Goofy, cunning, selfless, and sometimes serious to a fault, Wolfwood also wanders this vast planet following his own goals, bringing peace where he can in the name of God. But for where he and Vash are so similar in countless ways, there's an important difference. A path in life they both walk on opposite ends of. Whereas Vash's refusal to ever take another's life is an unbreakable chain that holds him to his ideals, Wolfwood broke those shackles years ago no longer fearing the outcomes of taking the life of another. So for all their similarities, their adventures and friendships, there will always be a dividing line that they both walk on opposite sides of, with Wolfwood admonishing Vash multiple times throughout the series for his reckless choice of protecting every life, no matter the cost to himself or others. To Wolfwood, aiming his gun and pulling the trigger now can save the lives of others in the future, and he won't hesitate, something Vash can never agree with him on. This dynamic is tested multiple times throughout the series' run, with the duo fighting off enemies who by all means have done countless terrible evils across the planet, leaving potentially hundreds dead in their wake. And where Wolfwood is ready to end their lives now for the potential greater good, Vash refuses, instead looking for another way no matter how pointless it may end up being. This right here, this shit right here, this is why Trigun goes from a stylish gunslinging western tale to a true commentary on the actions and evils of man. Now not just because these conflicts exist in the story with these ideals, but because the story makes it so apparent that both sides of these arguments have merit and are worth exploring. Wolfwood's intense, to the point method of cutting away the problem with no hesitation for the greater good, versus Vash's peaceful intentions backed by bullets that have been shot to save others and never to harm them. And throughout the series, both answers prove right and wrong. Sometimes Vash's methods might work, and the person he's fighting might truly understand Vash's heart, realizing the things they've done and the person they've become, but a lot of the times, it just doesn't work. There is no peaceful outcome that can be won. And that's where Wolfwood will arrive, cross of mercy over his shoulder, dealing out the Lord's justice. Wolfwood understands human nature because he's exactly that, a human, something Vash isn't. Humans are weak no matter how strong we try to appear. We're not God. 
not only are our powers limited, but we sometimes are driven to become the devil himself. Carrying this message in his heart, Wolfwood follows Vash along for his journey, suffering by his side, doing the dirty work that Vash can't bring himself to do, slowly beginning to fall deeper into despair as he himself is bloodying his own hands from the ones who stand in his way. While he always has, and always will, do what he feels needs to be done, the toll it takes on his soul weighs heavier and heavier, the cross of his sins being too much to bear at times. And that's when Vash will be there extending his helping hand as he does with everyone else that crosses his path. Vash can't absolve Wolfwood of his past sins, nor can Wolfwood convince Vash to pull the trigger that can extinguish another soul to possibly save a different one. But together, they can look toward a new future, one that may be brighter than the dark world that they live in, both redeemed of their pasts, finally willing to forgive themselves. Between Vash, Knives, and Wolfwood, the main messages behind the words and the actions of the series are constantly displayed throughout. Vash believing in the goodness of people's hearts, to the point of even trusting them to a fault at his own detriment. Knives discarding any thought towards humans besides thanking them as the ants beneath him and his kind, taking everything until there's nothing left to consume. And Wolfwood, the human between them who walks somewhere in the middle, understanding both the good and evils of humanity, choosing for himself to decide the destiny that's in front of him. These themes all culminate at the ending of the series, both in the manga and in the anime, to make one of the most touching and heartfelt things I've ever got to experience, while also breaking me down in so many ways as I watch these people who are truly good and doing what they know is right, suffer time and time again at the hands of someone who just intrinsically disagrees with every single one of their motivations. It takes Trigun, a series that appears on the surface to just be about gun battles and cool designs, to a whole new level of depth that's commenting on humanity itself. And unlike a lot of other manga, anime, video games, whatever, it's explaining it all in the most stylish and beautiful way possible, letting you feel through emotion more than what you could ever feel through simple explanations. For that reason, mixed with the amazing art, memorable cast, and an anime adaptation that takes the series in its own but still fantastic direction, Trigun is easily in my top 5 manga and anime of all time. Don't, don't know what the other 4 are, so just don't ask. So lastly, what I want to finish off with is how I recommend you get into the series if you are interested, be it reading or watching. Like I had mentioned earlier, and you've no doubt seen throughout this video, the artwork is a very love it or leave it type deal, where if you think it's just too much and too busy, I don't think your opinion will change too much during the read of it. If you fall into that category, I do absolutely recommend the anime. It does a stellar job of adapting the early story as well as doing its own stuff, it's still just an all around great way to experience the series. There's also a feature-length movie titled Trigun Badlands Rumble that came out back in 2008. It's basically just a Trigun story set in a random period of time during the main storyline, not canon to the main series or anything, but just a fun time. I do recommend it. It's also really well animated, got that madhouse money. Good stuff. If you're on the other side and don't mind reading or watching, there's also Trigun Multiple Bullets, a standalone set of chapters that came out slightly before Badlands Rumble did. It features two chapters by Night Owl himself that take place during the story and were originally released as pack-in extras for the Badlands Rumble limited edition box set. On top of that, other one-shot chapters for Trigun have been made by multiple famous artists, such as Yusuke Takayama, longtime assistant to Hiroyuki Takei of Shaman King fame, and uh, like I said, watch that video of mine, <clears throat> Boichi of Sun Ken Rock and Dr. Stone fame, Satoshi Mizukami of Lucifer and Biscuit Hammer and Spirit Circle fame, and many more. Takayama's follows a side character from the main story, Raide the Blade, on his own adventure that focuses on his journey as a swordsman on a planet of guns, while Boichi's is a small side story involving Vash and a plant on the Fritz. But the main attraction here is that goddamn Boichi Vash to stampede, like, whoo boy, this, look, look at this, look at this, this right here, that's my shit. 
um, and can't find too much on Mizukami's, unfortunately, but Spirit Circle is really good, so I bet it's probably pretty kick-ass. Just fun little side stories. I think they're super worth the time. Now, the manga itself is super out of print in the United States, with original publishing rights being held by Dark Horse. So, God only knows if we're ever going to get to see that series again physically. Shout out Eden, It's an Endless World, also locked up in Dark Horse Jail. It is available online on sites where you would usually buy manga digitally direct from Dark Horse itself, and if you look hard enough in the right places, you, you can find them out there online. You do you, just remember to support things you like when you can. Eh, that's all. The anime's rights are owned here in the US by Funimation, so it is available to stream on the Funimation app as well as Hulu. There is no Blu-ray version that was ever released here, so the original 4x3 is what you'll be watching in. Same old crispy jittery frames from 1998. There's also this DVD set that is pretty decent in itself, but holy shit! Look at this reverse cover art for the case itself. Look, look at this poster. I love this. This is a great addition to the anime. 10 out of 10. Worth it for this. All in all, I just wanted to make a small video about how much I love this series and how reading the manga itself for the first full time floored me in a way that I just wasn't expecting. Obviously because this small video is now way past its initial length. All I can really say is, if you like cool shit, in-depth explorations of meaningful themes, and honestly the 90s themselves, I can't recommend Trigun enough. From harrowing to uplifting, I'll hold this series close in my heart forever, following in Vash's path in hopes of spreading both love and peace.